Hello, uh, I'm Sharon Scott Wilson with Resort Trades. We're in for a real treat today. We have Sherry Levitin. Uh, as uh, many of you know, uh, Sherry, I, but uh, she's well known in many circles, including within the timeshare professional community. She's a powerful and inspiring public speaker, leadership development expert, and executive coach. So she's one of 50 keynote speakers in sales, a best-selling author, and I'm proud to say a friend. So thank you, Sherry, for joining us today, and thank you for to our attendees also. So uh, what are we going to be learning about today? I think what uh, I'd like to hear is, uh, Sherry, you have uh, some new thoughts on the new buyer. So maybe you can kind of explain where you're going with that. Yeah, hi, and thank you for having me, Sharon. And I appreciate the timing. This is the first year in, I don't know, maybe over 20 years uh, that I have another engagement and won't make the Arta Conference. So uh, maybe coming virtually makes sense uh, given the world that we're in. But um, really what I'd like to start with is there, there is a completely new customer and the customer was changing prior to the pandemic. I've had the amazing opportunity to spend 18, 20 years in the timeshare industry, as many of you know, and we've been um, honored to create onboarding programs for companies from Hilton to Wyndham. Uh, RSCI sponsored us for years where we did seminars literally all over the world from India to Africa to um, all over. And so it's been a pleasure serving in the industry. And in the last five years, uh, since the publication of my book, Heart and Cell, We've expanded into many other verticals, primarily healthcare, um, software as a service, uh, education, senior living. And really what's been so exciting for us is it's given us two perspectives. One, all of the interesting things we've learned in a more complex B2B sale, how those organizations are run, the analytics that they use, understanding the buyer, um, so that's been really exciting and, and for us, but it's also been very validating to see that the principles that we share and the metrics we use and the understanding we have of the buyer, uh, really in many ways, um, we're more advanced than some other industries. So having both of those has been a, a real joy and, and very interesting. But I also know that in the last few years, I've learned some things that our clients in the industry are so excited for us to bring back some fresh ideas. Um, I've also um, am honored that I am one of 10 thought leaders on the Gartner panel. And so we get access to the latest research that they have about who is the buyer today and how has the buyer changed? And I could tell you, as you all know, not only has the buyer changed, but the conditions have changed. And I'm going to start with one statistic. And then if you don't mind, Sharon, I'm going to tell you a story because it really resonated with a lot of our viewers. So um, Michael Dell, I just saw uh, Michael Dell's uh, introductory speech to his users at his user group, and he made a statement and it's pretty interesting. He said that online purchasing since the pandemic is up by 25%. Now that shouldn't be a surprise. We were all home, we were all buying everything. I mean, the way we travel, the way we eat, the way we exercise, everything started happening from home. <laughs> But 25%, but here's the important piece here. With it, consumer demand for service, speed, and security has skyrocketed. So our customers today have much higher expectations than they ever did before. It's called comparative expectations or the Amazon effect. We've all experienced it as consumers, right? So what we really need to think about is as an industry is, how do we compete really with the way customers are now used to buying and how what their expectation is for buying? So that's a statistic that's really going to drive a lot of our conversation today is this increased expectation and a completely different buyer's journey 
and an enhanced collaboration between sales and marketing. And I'd like to share four major shifts that we need to make as an industry to connect with our new consumer, to engage our new consumer and to compete with all of the other ways now they can travel, whether it's Airbnb, um, whether it's VRBO or whether it's just going through Expedia, um, times have changed and we need to change and adapt as well. Well, you know what, Sherry, we uh, took the liberty of taking several of your blog entries uh, that you had recently. One was about how you came to buy a Porsche, or, <laughs> or I guess as Germans would say Porsche. <laughs> so, Porsche. Porsche. <laughs> So. Yeah, that, that was an interesting thing. So we've been um, and and for all of your listeners, we have I put out three free videos uh, every single week on LinkedIn. And the reason I use LinkedIn, that's where really the B2B audience is, I would say, um, you, you know, for more of a B2C sale, they're, they're going to be on um, Facebook or Instagram. But we put out it. This was sort of a surprise to us. Uh, I was just having a conversation with somebody and we had a camera on and I was relaying a story of buying a car and the video just went crazy viral. I mean, we had what, 650,000 views. So we were sort of blown away, like what's going on here? And I mean, in, in everything from people selling timeshare to people, we had 2000 people from Salesforce, over 2,500 um, from Oracle. And this thing just sort of went viral to India, to Africa. And as we analyzed it, we thought it struck a chord because the person that sold me the car gets who the new buyer is. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell the story if you'd like for, for our audience here, in case you haven't heard it, it basically, um, you know, a lot of people during the pandemic bought pandemic puppies. Uh, I decided I wanted to buy a pandemic Porsche. I'd had the same car for eight years and I wanted to treat myself. And I did what everybody does when they go to buy a car, right? I looked online and I live in Park City and there's two dealerships. One's 45 minutes away, the other's an hour and a half. I prefer the one 45 minutes away, right? So I look online and I call the first guy 45 minutes away, the first salesman, and let's call him Roland. And I say, hey, I'm looking on your site. You've got three cars here. Can you send me the specs? Can you send me the pricing and the information? And Roland says, ah, you're going to have to come in and take a test drive. I said, well, Roland, I'm not going to do that. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Sorry. You know, like I'm not going anywhere. So, you know, he says, well, you got to come in. We got great deals. If you buy today, it's a holiday weekend. So, of course, I don't. So I call the second guy and I get a hold of a guy named Sean. And I say, hey, Sean, can you tell me a little bit about your cars? I'm looking online. I see two that I really like. Well, he not only sends me the pricing immediately and sends me all the information. He says, hey, how about if we jump on a Zoom call? Because if we don't have it, we can sort of create it together. I'm like. That sounds great. Sure. So we get on a Zoom call and we start having fun, you know, and we start, you know, this is the color. These are the options. And, you know, because I want white with beige interior, very hard to find. But he says, I'm on it. I can find it for you. So now I'm getting a little committed. Right. <laughs> so two days later, Sean connects with me on LinkedIn and on Facebook. And then he starts sharing my videos and commenting and whatnot. And, you know, a couple of weeks later, I kind of go dark because, it's not like I have to buy a car. So what happens is he, two weeks later, I get a video text sent to my phone of the exact car that we had chosen on a Zoom car, on a Zoom call, coming off the trailer wrapped like a present. <laughs> And he starts taking a picture of it. And he's like, look, oh, can you smell the letter? That, oh, gosh, it smells so good. Oh, here's the steering wheel. Here's the outside. Doesn't that look good? Hey, if you want to come in and visit today, we're serving chili. So, of course, I go down to the lot. There's the car. The pricing's right. We The only part we do face-to-face -face is the paperwork. And I leave with a brand new white Porsche Cayenne. <laughs> now, of course, on the way back, I drove it through the other lot to show Roland, hey, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> but, but the point of the story is this, and I think the reason that it hit such a chord, Sharon, is this. 
Sales processes today are no longer linear. And back when we were training the sales process, it was we're going to do a warm up. We're going to do a discovery. It's 90 minutes. It's not 90 minutes anymore. One of the big shifts I believe we all need to make in sales is called omni channel sales and marketing. We need to go where the customer is. And today the customer doesn't just come face to face. In fact, Gartner tells us customers are 67 percent through the buyer's journey before they ever even talk to a salesperson, meaning before they come to our sales centers, before they visit us, don't think they haven't gone online. Now, I know, depending on the demographic, they're going to do more research. You know, some are going to do more research than others. But as an organization, we need to look at the entire buyer's journey and ask ourselves what happens from the moment we contact the customer. And I feel very strongly in this industry and in all industries that we map out with sales and marketing departments. We're doing this now in our seminars where we're putting up the buyer's journey on a board. We're bringing in sales and marketing and bringing in all the leadership and saying, OK, here's the first point of contact. They call a call center. How do they feel? Because we also know that customers will switch brands based on the way their experience is, how they feel, is there consistency? So um, it's very, very important that we map out the whole process, every single touch point along the way. And salespeople, I have some people fight me on this, but we should be looking, if particularly for in-house and we know who's coming in, why aren't we looking our customers up on Facebook, on LinkedIn? Why aren't we shortening that whole discovery process by finding out everything we can about them? Um, we're teaching people to use video as an anti-rescission strategy. Why? Customers are seven times more likely to open video than they are um, likely to open up an email for an anti. They're, they're not answering the phone anymore. You got a three percent answer rate. So by using all these multiple channels of communication where our customers are, we're not only enhancing the experience of the customer's journey, but we can make certain that we're giving them the content that we want them to see instead of leaving it to choice that they might read negative reviews online or whatever else. I want to know that the minute my customer is booked from a marketing perspective, I'm curating content that's all about my product so that they don't have to go surfing for it on their own. That's that's great. Hey, Sherry, I have two questions Yeah, uh, about the Gartner Thought Leader uh, panel. Firstly, I, I was unacquainted with Gartner personally. I admit ignorance there. So uh, if you could kind of explain uh, what they do and what you're uh, what you do on the panel. And also you mentioned something about sense makers. Mm. So uh, I'd love to hear about that. Well, this was perhaps the, the biggest honor I could imagine. And I'm also going to be um, really vulnerable, Sharon, and tell you that when I've been invited to some of these things in the last couple of years, I kind of had imposter syndrome. I thought, oh, my God, I felt like you like, oh, my God, I get to be a thought leader on Gartner. But like You're, you're you know, a star. I, I came from timeshare. I don't know, because oh, well, a lot of their that research, makes you a star. I well, I, I, you know, now people say if you can sell timeshare, you can sell anything. Right. right? Because, <laughs> I mean, we are the best salespeople in the world. There's no question in my mind. I've noticed that working in software and other industries, nobody's better than a timeshare salesperson um, for creating a need when there isn't one. See, because right, a lot of these guys that are selling software, hi, we're looking for a software product that does this, this, and this. Oh, we happen to have that. So now you're only competing with a competing offer. You're, you're not creating a need very often when there isn't one. Well, but, and connecting <laughs> emotionally too. It, but I will say, Sharon, and here's what I found interesting. Um, at first, I thought when I was working with some of these other companies that, well, software is not emotional, like selling a CRM or selling voice activated software isn't emotional. It is. Even when you're selling to eight decision makers, um, think about this. The reason the CFO wants to hit his numbers or her numbers may not have anything to do with just the numbers. It may have to do with and we have a story we worked with Adobe. And there was a salesperson named Nikki and she couldn't close a deal. And as soon as we taught skin, bone and heart questions, what I used to call first, second and third level questions, 
She closed a million dollar deal she'd been working on for a year and a half. Why? Yeah. Because she finally said to the CFO, okay, I know your problem is, is that, you know, you don't have your information in the cloud. I know you know that it'll help you hit your numbers, but what would that mean to you personally? So she asked that heart question mm -hmm. and the guy's demeanor totally changed. He said, are you kidding me? Pre-pandemic. He says, I'm on the road 286 days a year. If we hit our numbers, I could actually watch my kid play ball. Oh. Why don't you resend that proposal? Wow. That's a great story. When, when you're selling to companies, you're selling to people. And, and that's where these salespeople forget that. Now, it's more complex because you've usually got eight to 10 decision makers in a six month sales cycle. So that's what I've had to learn. But I just wanted to start by saying, don't be overly impressed because I didn't know who they were either. And I had to sort of get through my insecurities and feelings of, I don't know this world. How am I going to learn it? Um, and fortunately, I've met some wonderful mentors along the way. Um, so so Gartner and Forrester are, are really the leading um, you know, consulting firms and research firms. They do many things, but one of the big things they do is they do research on buyer behavior. So we can guess all we want about why buyers do what they do, but Gartner actually does the research. And um, I had been a big uh, fan of the Challenger sale. I think it's one of the greatest sales books of all time. And the person who leads the panel is Brent Adamson, who's now become a dear friend of mine. He's the distinguished vice president of Gartner, and he wrote the book, most successful sales book of all time, right? Like wow. it's one of those, God, I wish I'd written that. Um, but so I, I was asked to, um, right after I got to be in the Salesforce film, uh, the story of sales, uh, Gartner got a hold of me and there's 10 sales thought leaders in B2B and B2C sales that are on this panel such that when Gartner gets their research, they share it with us first. And they say, what do you think? Are you seeing this with your customers? We want to get feedback from you before we present it at our big conference every year. And we give them our feedback. But the best part is we are allowed as thought leaders to use the research in our training and very few people are allowed to use it. So we're now able to give seminars and executive retreats using this invaluable research and it has been life changing to really understand what's going on in the mind of the buyer. One of the big things that I learned from Gartner, and we've created a whole course around this called the adaptive seller, is that if you think about how the customers changed, again, even in the last year, right, we've got a couple of factors here. You've got increased access to information like never before, right? In fact, when I started in timeshare, right, as an OPC or, or even in sales on the line at Marriott, right, we were the purveyors of information. We, we were the fabulous, you know, like all you had to do was build rapport and trust and they believed everything you said, right? <laughs> and there, were, there really wasn't a way to check it. I mean, they could call their uncle like or something, but, you, you know, <laughs> we, you built trust and that was good enough. Well, today, customers can get all the information they need. And according to Gartner, it's not accessing information that's the challenge today, it's filtering it. And so what happens is they've got all of this information that they get on their own. They've got the white papers, they've got the Yelp reviews in our industry. Now they've got the exit companies. It's like, oh my God, what do I believe? They're confused. They're absolutely confused. Sorting out the need to knows from the must knows is debilitating. So with that and, and customers also say it's all credible information. So it's not that it's bogus, it's just, it's conflicting and credible. So the big shift today is that customers don't have to just trust the seller. They have to trust their ability to decide. Hmm. Now that sounds simple, but what they talk about are three selling behaviors. And I don't know if um, I, I'm actually going to going to give you a whole webinar that I did that, that you can post um, so you can see it graphically because this was conversational. But there's there's three types of selling behaviors today, according to Gartner. The first type is 
the salesperson who's the giver of information. And so the giver of information basically says, well, let me tell you all about our point system. It's great. Here's how you use it. Here's how it works. Here's how you make your reservations. Here's all the cool places you can go. Yeah. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> Which it's not a bad thing. It's just not the ultimate thing because the truth is they probably already have a lot of information. They've heard about it. They've read about it. They can, you know, go look at reviews. And, and so that's okay, but it's not the most productive way to sell anymore. Now, the second type of seller is the teller of information. Oh, we see this a lot in timeshare, right? The teller of information says, I've been doing this 20 years. I've been doing this five years. Let me tell you what I think you should buy based on my experience, because I'm smart. So let me tell you what I think you should do. Well, the problem with that is we also know um, salespeople, according to Gallup, are the second least trusted of all professionals today, second only to, I'd say, guess who, politicians. Um, they're the second least trusted of all professionals, so it's not very credible. But it's the third type of sales behavior where we're really focused today, and that is the sense maker. What the sense maker does, subtle but huge, is the sense maker says, look, we know you have a lot of information. We know you've heard a lot. We know you've read a lot. We know you've even probably seen ads. I, I like fess up about resales, bring it to the forefront. They've all got the objection today. Don't hide it. You lose credibility. We know you have a lot of information. What I'm going to do today is show you how to buy a product like ours. By the time you're done with this presentation, you will know how to decide. I call it being a helping brand. I'm not selling you Hilton. I'm not selling you Wyndham. I'm going to share with you the questions you should be asking, what you should be thinking about that you've never even thought of and what the pros and cons are of your options. Now, anybody who's watching this knows me well enough to know, I am doing this because once I am the expert and I show them how to buy a product like mine and I don't care if they buy mine, they're going to buy mine. Because what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a framework that shows them what they should be looking for. And those are all my differentiating values. Uh, that's what differentiates my product or my service from any other option. Well, that's amazing. Uh, Sherry, do you think that after the pandemic is over, which thank God, I think we're getting Lord willing <laughs> to that point, is is virtual selling uh, going away or do you think it's here to stay? Oh, this is where I'm so excited. I'm so glad you asked me that question. Um, we really doubled down on virtual selling and now, of course, they call it hybrid. Um one of the things, well, let me give you some stats. During the pandemic, this shouldn't be surprising, 90% of all sales were virtual. Uh, no surprise there. But here's what may be surprising. 86% of millennials will take a massive pay cut today to work from home. And sales leaders predict that all sales will be, ver excuse me, 50% of sales will stay virtual even after the pandemic. Why? There's too many advantages. Number one, think of all the money that you're saving on brick and mortar. Um, number two, um, not having all of the time and expense of customers coming to you. And I think what we really learned in our industries and what a lot of other industries learned is oh my God, I need another revenue stream. Because there's companies we all know of, they had to completely shut down. And they had, yeah, maybe they had telemarketing, but let's not confuse telemarketing with really maximizing virtual sales using technology, using Zoom, using chat features, using polling, um, and, and really learning how to engage the customer from afar. Not to mention, now you can hire salespeople from all over, you, you can hire salespeople from anywhere. So you've just opened up a pool and people would rather work from home. 
So we're working with, I would say the major part of our business right now is performing master classes, teaching organizations, not how to do phone sales. This isn't telemarketing, really maximizing virtual. And the results are astounding. The savings are astounding and we're even finding closing rates are matching and sometimes exceeding. Plus we can get to more consumers faster. So we're recommending, yes, even though you've got people coming in uh, to your resort or your establishment or your podium or whatever it is you're running, why not have an alternate distribution channel and learn to do it right? Um, but here's why I'm excited about it personally and emotionally. I believe that we get, there's not many times in life where you can really define what success means. And Sharon, I can tell you that when I grew up in sales in the 80s, in this industry, that success meant a 60, 70 hour work week. You were exhausted. Um, your health might have gone to hell. Uh, you might have had a divorce. And, but you just did whatever it took. And I think technology and the young people are helping us to redefine what's really important in life. And I think during COVID, I mean, I can't tell you how many people are saying, I'm never going back. This is great. Or other people saying, we're going to have a hybrid. This is why Facebook and Google and, and Dell, they're all doubling down on a hybrid environment and saying, wait a minute, our employees are happier. They're 86% more productive. The company's saving money. And yes, we still want to see them in person, but maybe we'll have one team that goes in person and we've got another team that's selling virtually or we're doing a hybrid with both. But I think that I'm personally excited that we're going to be able to help single moms who maybe just want to work four hours a day that um, or men. I don't mean to be um, uh, stereotyping here. But I think that we are finding we are coming into a new age where the younger people are going to help us to see I can work from anywhere. I can sell, you know, Virginia property in the Dominican Republic. I can have a lifestyle and with the right management, the right technology and the right tools, tactics and training, they can not only you know, make their budgets, they can exceed them and be much more profitable in the long run really is the Zoom world has, and, and COVID. Uh, if there's a bright side to the pandemic, this is it. It's opened up a whole different uh, world of opportunities. And I think it's really, uh, I'm with you. I think it's really amazing. Uh, and also it helps you connect. I think that um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, why is it so difficult for sellers to focus on the buying process rather than the sales process? And I think selling virtually uh, helps them do that. But uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, they're really probably two different questions. I think it's always been difficult for sellers to focus on the customer rather than to focus on the sales process and, you know, we're going to do it this way. And, and after this step comes this step, instead of really asking yourself the more important question, which is, does this make sense anymore? And how does this make my customer feel? You know, we do an exercise online where we actually have sales and marketing people go through the buying process. Like I was saying before, this new buyer's journey and map out every single touch point. And then they put an emoji on it and say, how does the customer feel? Mm -hmm. Because if if we're sending them you know, four emails in a row and um, they're, they're not coordinated or or we're doing things that, that put them at disease, um, they're not gonna buy from us. There's too many other options today. And people are gonna go, like I said at the beginning, where it's easy, where they feel good, where they're having, um, a wonderful guest experience. But I think that um, as sellers, there is always the tendency to default into thinking about our commission or getting impatient uh, instead of really 
putting ourselves in our in our customers' shoes. It's it's always been there. Well, it's like your book, Heart and Cell, which incidentally I loved. Uh, and I think one of the main points I got out of it was it's all about empathy, having mm -hmm. empathy with your, with your, well, whoever you're talking to. <laughs> And yeah, and it and it sounds good, but then in the doing of it, it 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 it, you know, it otherwise it it just becomes a cliche, right? And and um, one of the questions we love asking now in our seminars is if there's two things we learned that every salesperson needs. We need our competency. We need to know our product, and we need our empathy. We need to know our customer. And then I love doing this. And, and we could do it on a poll function or do it live. But what's more important, empathy, knowing your customer or competency, knowing your product, if you had to choose one. And the rooms usually split maybe 60, 40, because they kind of know where I'm going and they, and they say empathy. But the truth is it's a trick question. And in fact, according to Harvard Business Review, empathy and competency make up 90% of persuasion. And that's what sales is, right, of, of persuasion. And they're both equally important. But here's the thing. The order matters. Empathy gets you in the door. Competency, reliability, and integrity keep you there. And there's a tendency, right, to just start pitching too soon, which we've always talked about, that you need to do discovery. I would say one of the biggest shifts today, though, is that, we have to, we can't do just what we've always done and say that the product's different and say that the journey's different. And so we're teaching more of this sort of challenger concept, if you will, of early on um, giving them a trend or a piece of information that they might not know, giving them um, something that they hadn't thought of. Uh, for example, you know, vacationing at uh, campground industry. We've been doing uh, quite a bit of work in the campground industry. We might say, hey, um, did you know that RV sales are up 346% yet campground, you know, camp, uh, campground availability hasn't increased? What that means is it's going to get harder and harder to find a space. So we're sort of coming out with this big fat claim, if you will, or this um, trend where people say, oh my God, I hadn't thought of that before. But notice I'm not selling. I'm just giving them an insight that they may not have had before about travel. And I think for those of us selling timeshares or vacation clubs, um, security, as I said in the beginning, is a big deal. So did you know that more and more travelers are realizing the importance of security and safety and cleanliness. And that is why there's a trend too. So you really need to script this in so that customers are thinking differently early on. So so that's a so that's a very important component today. Well I know that in sales I I'm not a sales person uh but I've heard it said that you've got to create value uh, for the customer. So is, is, is what's a new definition of value creation, if you will? You know, I took a note here because I knew you were going to ask that question. I have a definition that I wanted to share with you. Um, actually, that's about um, omni-channel. You, you know, value creation today, again, it used to just be this idea of a, of a rent versus own, right? And showing that you're going to save money. And then for years and years, I thought it's not just financial logic, it's emotional logic. But today, value goes into sense making. And it's again, whether you buy from me or not, I'm going to show you how to buy a product like ours. And, and I, I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, I'm going to give you two examples, because to some, this is nebulous. And value is teaching them how to decide, teaching a customer how to buy and how to decide. So um, let's say I'm selling bottled water as an example. It's a confusing industry, just like timeshare, just like vacation clubs. There's a lot of information out there. Water now has become a multi-billion dollar industry. 
So we've all bought bottled water, so it's easy to understand. So if I'm a giver of information, I'm going to say, hey, I'm drinking a Pellegrino here. Uh, let me tell you what's in it. Uh, it's bottled in, I would need my glasses, Sharon. Um, it's, you know, bottled in France. I'm going to make it up. It's got carbonate, blah, blah, blah in it. Let me give you a white paper on it. Let me give you some testimonials on all the people that liked it. See all our happy customers. That's the giver of information. Okay, they're just giving them more information. The teller of information, on the other hand, uh, would get a bottle of smart water and say, want to be smart? Want to be wicked smart like me? You should drink smart water. Take my advice and drink smart water. So now I'm the teller of information. But the sense maker gives value because value is I'm going to help you sort through the noise and learn about how to buy a vacation product today. Now, the way I would do that is say, you know, what I'm going to do is share with you what you should consider when buying a product like ours. When buying a product like water, the first question you want to ask yourself is, am I buying it for health reasons or am I buying it um, because I want the taste? Because the truth of the matter is that 50% of the water um, is just tap water <laughs> in a pretty bottle. So if you're buying it for health, you need to look for X, Y, and Z. The second question you may want to ask yourself when buying bottled water is, you know, should you be um, getting fizzy water or should you be getting still water? And here's the questions you want to ask yourself. But the third question you want to ask yourself is, do you want to buy bottled water or do you want to do it in-house? Do you want to um, have a filter in your own home? And these are the three questions you need to ask yourself. If we can do that around vacation ownership and we've taught a few companies to do this, all of a sudden it changes the relationship with the customer. Here's the three things you should consider. Number one, are you with a company that's been in the industry for a long time? Number two, if you're selling a 10 year product, you might say, is this a product that has a deed or is it limited? Because, you know, and again, if, if you're a, a shorter term product, because then you'd say, because a lot of people today don't want to be locked in. The third thing you should consider is, and so again, you want to work with your teams to say, what are these three criteria I'm going to choose to show them how to buy a product like mine, whether they buy mine or not. That's value today. Mm -hmm. So so what if you're talking to a number of people? You, you're really trying to uh, connect and convince uh, more than just one couple, let's say, uh, how do you gain consensus with multiple stakeholders? Ah, uh, yes. Well, um, that's always been uh, an interesting challenge and in whether to do a podium or, or, or not to do a podium. But again, I, I think what's important um, when you're trying to gain consensus, you're usually going to have one that's more sold than another. You know, we call them a mobilizer or a champion. And what you want to do is identify who that person is and you want to have them do the selling for you because nobody believes a salesperson. So if I'm talking to you and your husband and two other couples, for example, or maybe there's some singles in there, what I'm going to do is say, I'm going to make you the hero. We can never be the hero of our own story, right? We learn that in Storytelling 101. So I'm going to say, Sharon, you know, you seemed excited about that this, this, and this, what is it that you're so excited about sharing? Can you share it with the group? So I'm going to empower you to be my champion and my mobilizer to sell the rest of the group. And I'm going to zip it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great idea. So um, how do we stop competing on price? Well, the, the only reason that anybody would compete on price is if they haven't differentiated their offering. Right. And if they haven't shown the value. And I think a lot of sellers, unfortunately, are, are selling out of their own pocket. And, and so really not competing on process on price, what that amounts to um, is, again, it's it's differentiating your product and differentiating the way you sell. It's not just what you sell, it's how you sell. And again, now I'm going to take us all the way back to the beginning when I was talking about an omni channel approach. I don't I think one of the best things we can do today 
is know everything about our customer before we even talk to them. And that's why, again, particularly if you're in-house, if you can look people up online, uh, you will gain an enormous amount of credibility. I talk about um, five things you should look for on LinkedIn as an example and how you don't have to spend as long on a discovery and it's going to it's going to create a lot of credibility right away when you can say, oh, I see that, you know, you went to the University of Colorado or, you know, I see that, um, you know, you've been at such and such company for five years. And then salespeople always say, oh, wouldn't that sound creepy, um, you know, that I've been looking them up? No, it's just Stalking. say, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I just say, you know, I like to know about the people I'm going to serve. And, you know, here's what I found. And basically, you're taking that first level discovery, you're doing it yourself and you're just confirming the information. And I will tell you, uh, we got one of the biggest deals we've ever gotten just last year because it was a big real estate company and they all told me, Jay is gonna be the tough one to sell. Okay, because I had a champion, right? That, that was on my side. <laughs> And Chris said, we're all in. We love you. We, we know your background. We love that you've been in timeshare. Da, da, da. But Jay is going to be a bugger. So what did we do? We spent two hours researching Jay. And then I found that, you know, Jay was on a podcast. So what did I do? I listened to the whole podcast. And as soon as I met Jay, I said, Jay, so great to meet you. I hope you don't mind. I like to find out a little bit about the people I'm going to serve. I love that podcast you did where you're talking about the nine leadership principles because at Leviton Group, you know, we really ascribe to particularly number five and number seven, you know, where you were talking about what well, Jay looks at me and he goes, that's three years old. I didn't even know. Where'd you find that? <laughs> Again, I'm leading with empathy. What I'm finding out who Jay is and what's important. And again, I will tell you, I have had debates with um, sometimes your operators, oh, no, salespeople will prejudge. Well, you know what? That's yesterday. Today, we need to get all of the information we can. It is available. It's online. We can't sell to a persona. We have to sell to a person and do your due diligence. Now, I know if you have a tour that comes in, you know, and, and you don't know who they are ahead of time, you're, you're not going to, you know, have that ability. But for all of those of us who are in in-house, I think it's critical um, to do that and, um, you know, to really do that homework first. That is very wise. Well, Sherry, we're starting to run out of time here. In fact, we've gone way over, <laughs> but so worth it. I really appreciate your being with us. And I hope uh, we can invite you back again when, whenever you feel like it, really. But uh, at least by the fall. Uh, we'd love to have you anytime you're available. And uh, to our viewers, if you would go to resorttrades.com, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, uh, you will be apprised of when Sherry is going to return and our other speakers as well. So Sherry, thank you so much. Appreciate you're welcome, it. Sharon. All right. Bye. Have, have a great trip. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi, I'm Sharon Scott Wilson, publisher of Resort Trades. We have been bringing you free videos in the hopes that we can help solidify the Timeshare Resort community and provide you vacation ownership professional uh, that you are with some useful information. So uh, when you hit the uh, like button or share or comment, you're helping yourself too to be more integrated into the community, uh, helping others get to know you. So be an influencer, subscribe to the channel, uh, hit the bell icon so you'll be notified when we post a new video. And thank you. Good luck.